Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this week's or this month's webinar, Matrix Technologies, Why Virtualize the Industrial Network. And I wanted to turn this over to Dan McCarns, who's going to lead us through the presentation this month. Appreciate your attendance and hope you get something great out of it. We will be having Q&A at the end of the session, so please put your questions in the Q&A box. Thank you very much. Turn it over to Dan. Thanks, Dave. So wanted to just kind of start off by talking a little bit about Matrix. Um, we've been around 40 years, uh, established in 1980, so it's just a, a little bit older than I am. Uh, we have about 250 employees and have done more than 55 million in annual revenue, um, done projects across a number of different countries. Uh, and uh, we really focus on relationships. We want to develop those deep-seated relationships with uh, our clients. So over 85% of our projects are actually uh, repeat engagements with those clients. We are focused on a number of different areas, uh, oil and gas, chemical, food and beverage, consumer packaged products and pharmaceuticals, uh, aggregates, wine and spirits and metals. So pretty a diverse uh, set of industries that we target. We have a number of different experts uh, in industrial automation and information systems. Uh, that's kind of the area that I generally fall into. Uh, also manufacturing intelligence and MES, uh, process and facilities, and then general engineering, procurement and construction. So we uh, are a full service automation company. We can basically handle uh, every aspect of uh, a project that you might have. And then just a little bit about me. Um, there's my glamour shot there. Uh, I'm Dan McCarns. I'm a senior engineer in the Industrial Systems Division. Uh, I have a bachelor's in electrical engineering from the University of Toledo uh, here in Ohio. Uh, and I specialize in industrial systems uh, for automation, basically dealing with the uh, servers and virtualization, which will be the topic today, um, as well as networking, security, and compliance. Uh, if you've got regulatory issues, uh, those also can come into play there. Uh, backups and disaster recovery uh, that's a big uh, thing nowadays especially and uh, distributed control system design uh, where are we talking about the SCADA systems and and things like that so i'm not sure whether i should read these bullet points here down at the very bottom but just uh if you want to get a little bit personal my dad uh, my dad jokes are the best according to my kids but on to the agenda. Uh, what we're going to talk about today first is uh, virtualization. Some people are more familiar than others, uh, but we want to kind of get a, a fairly good background there first so we know that uh, the, the topic that we're talking about and then why you might want to use it in your industrial system. Uh, then we're going to move right into the advantages and the benefits uh, as well as some considerations. Um, you know, possibly may not be for everyone, or in the specific cases where it is, uh, how it might fit for you. And then uh, finally, really answering the question or trying to answer the question, does this make sense for your system? And as Dave mentioned, then we'll move on to the question and answers for anybody that has any specifics about them. Okay, so general virtualization, uh, what is it? Um, probably have heard the topic before. Uh, it actually can be broken down into two uh, separate topics. Um, but the primary way to look at it is that it's a decoupling of dependencies between uh, two interface layers in a, in a compute stack. I know that's a mouthful. Um, and in honesty, it's, it's an abstraction uh, or an encapsulation in terms of software. What does that mean? Well, it means that uh, when we have a traditional compute stack here, this is a very general diagram here, and you have hardware, and then you have the operating system, and they have applications on top, and then the user is interfacing at the very, very top. In order to kind of break the dependencies between the two, we insert an additional software layer either between the hardware and the operating system or between the operating system and the application. Uh, when we do it at the uh, hardware and operating system layer in between there, we call that software in between a hypervisor. And when we do it between the operating system, the application layer, we call that a runtime environment. Uh, what this gives us is a great deal of flexibility. 
Uh, the primary topic of this uh, presentation will be mostly on the hardware operating system abstraction. Uh, we'll touch just very, very briefly on the application um, and operating system abstraction. But in general, the topic of virtualization covers all of those. And uh, in all honesty, you've probably used them in some instances and not even known that you had. So there are two basic types, as I was talking about. You have hardware. Uh, which is decoupling from that underlying, uh, excuse me, I should say that the hardware virtualization decouples the operating system from the underlying hardware and the software. And the reason why we make that distinction is because uh, hardware virtualization carries with it a whole number of different other subtopics, whereas in software is, is more or less just one. Um, software virtualization we can talk about just at the very tail end, but most of this is regarding the flexibility of using hardware virtualization. So in the subtopics of hardware virtualization, the first we can see is there's server. This is what most people I would say if they're at all familiar with virtualization think about when they think about uh, virtualization. Uh, this is kind of the the topic where you hear about the cloud, what the cloud is. Uh, the cloud is largely based on uh, server virtualization. And this is where you have um, the operating systems uh, broken out from the physical hardware that they're traditionally running on. So if you have a, a computer and traditionally this would be a server, uh, you can run multiple instances of an operating system on top of it when you use that virtualization layer and you can kind of see this nice slide from Intel um, that kind of breaks that out. Whereas in you're no longer directly talking with the underlying hardware, you're talking with this abstraction or virtual machine monitoring layer, um, an older term for the hypervisor. And on top of that, you have what look like, or actually what they, they call them is virtual machines, meaning that they have hardware as far as the guest OS is concerned, uh, it has no knowledge of what's actually underneath. And that's kind of the, the power and the flexibility of it is that it gives you the opportunity to um, move those machines across different places or support them in different ways. And I would say that flexibility is one of the major uh, reasons to go virtualized. We can talk a little bit more about that in, in future slides. Hardware virtualization also covers uh, networking. In fact, networking is one of the primary means by which uh, these virtual machines are able to talk, just like in uh, traditional machines or traditional servers. Uh, the way that we talk to other machines is through networking. So having networking itself be virtualized gives you an additional layer of flexibility. You can see on the left here we have uh, server uh, virtualization with uh, the coupling of network virtualization where the virtual machines have virtual network cards and then you have a virtual switch that allows them to talk to each other. And in this particular case, you can see you have a single physical server in this brown boundary box that then allows those physical machine or those virtual machines that are uh, physically residing on that that server to talk to each other without ever actually leaving that server. And one of the neat, the, the neat things about that is that the communication between those virtual machines can be extremely fast because that's all happening in memory. And then if any traffic needs to leave that server to physically talk to another um, host that's running virtual machines or a physical host or uh, an HMI, if we want to talk um, in, in the industrial systems uh, line of talk, then it can uh, exit out that physical NIC on that server and then go into a physical switch and go out to where it needs to go. Uh, we can also virtualize routers and firewalls. And in this particular case, this is actually a, a slide from Cisco. Um, if you're at all familiar with Cisco's uh, line of uh, firewalls, one of their more classic ones is called the ASA or the Adaptive Security Appliance. And they've actually had a uh, a feature where you could virtualize the functions of that, meaning that the same physical hardware, you could run two separate instances of the firewall software that can be essentially um, completely isolated, and they call them security context if you speak the Cisco speak. But it's essentially the same thing. 
And uh, this is just one example. Uh, many vendors can can do this either on their physical hardware or having what we would consider that uh, security context. It's a virtual appliance. We could take that off of the physical hardware that uh, comes from Cisco and you could put it right on a traditional server a light, uh, right alongside another virtual machine. That's another way of virtualizing. So it, it adds a, a great deal of flexibility. Um, it kind of once again, it, it takes away the uh, direct dependency between the physical hardware and the logical operating system or the, the function that you're trying to provide. Moving on, uh, hardware virtualization regarding storage. And this might actually be one of the instances that you may be even more, more familiar with than most. Um, a lot of people who have ever deployed a server of any type are concerned about their data. Um, we know that things fail. Hard drives can fail. That no uh, device is perfect or infallible and it certainly won't run forever. But uh, in order to preserve that, we oftentimes deploy data in a redundant fashion. We put the same information on multiple hard drives, for instance. And usually uh, that's done using uh, a technology called RAID. Uh, it stands for Redundant Array of Independent Drives. And there's kind of a, a cute little video here that I um, borrowed from these PowerCert videos that just kind of shows this. You can watch this happen. Oh, I think I clicked on the wrong place. There it goes. Um, you can see that data is being written to those platters on disk one and disk two, and this would be what's called RAID one, basically mirroring the data. That way, if you lose one of the two disks, nothing goes wrong. Um, you can replace that. For instance, uh, if some scary laser happens to destroy one of your disks, uh, you have another copy and you can continue to do uh, whatever is your, your process is doing without interruption. Uh, there are other different uh, ways to deploy RAID, but in the uh, example, when applications are writing to it, they're looking at this virtual hard drive, as you would call it. They don't see the physical disks, and that is a form of hardware virtualization, in this case storage. Uh, you could also do it in a number of different ways. Um, vSAN is another example. Um, this is where instead of sending data across different physical drives, we're sending data across different physical servers. Um, it's a little bit more complicated, uh, and, and uh, I won't go into it in a whole lot of great detail, but you can see this other animation on the right running that talks about that, where uh, if you look at these kind of uh, square boxes with these lines in them, uh, those are supposed to represent physical servers that have disks inside them. And you create this virtual pool, similar to how you do it with the RAID array, that presents itself as a single place for applications to write to. And the data is actually written across multiple servers. That way you can survive even an entire failure of a server and your data is still safe. Uh, this one obviously comes into play when we're talking about the more classic hardware virtualization that we talked about earlier, the servers, because vSAN is a feature of that, uh, specifically of a particular hypervisor, uh, as we mentioned earlier, that software layer that sits in between. But uh, many uh, servers uh, that are virtualized, whether it be with um, vSAN or with uh, other platforms, um, support that capability. So it's, it's not exclusive to uh, VMware, which is the, the maker of this particular software, vSAN. So uh, virtualization essentially can improve uh, your data integrity and availability, something that many people are uh, very concerned with. Next, we have what I kind of call a, a hardware slash application layer of virtualization. Um, this is also technology that probably more people are familiar with than realize when it comes to what uh, virtualization actually is. But going back to our original definition, it's an abstraction. So uh, most people who are classically using a desktop computer, they have a piece of physical hardware, they have an, a classic operating system on top of it, and they run their applications. Well, what happens when uh, the applications that you want aren't on your desktop? Or maybe you don't want them to be there for security reasons. Well, in this case, you have things like uh, desktop virtualization, which 
uh, can mean a number of different things. In this case, you can deploy it in about three different ways. And I would say there's actually even one more, but for the application and control system layer, we're going to talk about it in this context. You have desktop sessions where you have a single physical server that allows users to connect and see a desktop using remote desktop, uh, a technology that uh, is primarily Microsoft centric, but uh, there are other ways to connect. And you also have pooled VMs where instead of having multiple users connect to a single server to get and get their own personal desktop, but still running under the same operating system, you have virtual machines that are created um, to allow users to connect to. In the pooled VM sh uh, scenario, they're shared, meaning that it's kind of a round robin scenario. Or personal, meaning that those VMs are created dynamically. And that's another feature we can talk about just a little bit later about the flexibility of virtualization um, for individual users as they need them. In any case, the end user experience is largely the same. Um, there might be different reasons why you would do that under the hood. But in any case, applications and the desktop experience are abstracted from the user. So in this case, those are examples of desktop virtualization. And for IT administrators especially, and in, in this, the context of this discussion, OT administrators as well, this makes delivery of, of those applications very, very flexible. It also gives you kind of a, a single place to administer that, which is extremely important when you're thinking about scalability and deployment. And finally, um, we have uh, application virtualization, which I said we'd touch on just very, very briefly. Um, software portability is a big deal nowadays because not everybody uses the same operating system, uh, whether it be different versions of Windows or Mac OS. Uh, Linux flavors, various different operating systems exist and they may be used for different reasons. But if you have an application that is properly written to take advantage of this, um, you're able to actually have that application run on multiple different operating systems without a whole lot of extra work. And the reason that is, is because you have an intermediary layer. In this case, uh, for lack of a a more specific example because this is gets a little bit into a gray area. We'll call it a runtime environment. And it basically provides an abstraction between the OS and the application. And this gives the application programmer a lot of flexibility to not have to worry about their code and their application being ported between different operating systems. They can largely write it the same and they target the um, intermediary layer, which they have an expectation will be the same. And then the intermediary layer, that runtime environment, is tailored to um, do the heavy lifting when it comes to interfacing with the underlying operating system. You can just kind of see this, uh, especially on the right. I like how it kind of shows how you have this isolation layer or that intermediary, the runtime environment that separates each application from the more traditional applications that are running on the right that directly interface with the operating system. And if it, anybody's ever heard of Java or .NET, um, those are two. Um, platforms that are oftentimes used to create that intermediary layer. Next, uh, we've got the major players in the industry uh, who basically uh, is putting out all this this great technology. Uh, are these names that we've heard of? Can we trust this? And the answer is yes. Uh, these are actually very, very big players. Uh, VMware is probably the largest in terms of uh, virtualization. They've been in the game a long, long time. Microsoft, I'm sure everyone's heard of. They've thrown their hand in the mix and are actually probably one of the, the I would say the second largest player. Um, if you don't count the cloud providers, which we are not talking about today. Uh, Nutanix is a kind of a specialized company that uh, does a little bit of both, uh, the hardware and the software in terms of virtual virtualization and providing a, a complete package. Um, Stratus, that's a, a very specialized one. They deal with a, a little bit of extra redundancy in their hardware. Uh, Dell, which I'm sure everyone has heard of, as well as HP. And then you even have some entries from very specific automation companies like Rockwell Automation. They've worked and partnered with a couple of other companies like Dell and uh, VMware to create a specialized solution that they can then support for you. So in any case, um, you're, you're going to want to use a, something that is put together uh, by a, a vendor or vendors that uh, can give you support. Um, 
it is possible to spin your own, but I would suggest that only be if you're going to play around. When it comes to a production system, you're going to want something that comes from uh, a company or companies that can give you support and troubleshooting. Because like anything, um, you don't have to be an expert in all these areas in order to utilize this technology, but you absolutely are going to want the support that comes from the experience of these various vendors when something um, you may run into an issue or something isn't working the way you would expect. So uh, let's go into the advantages. Uh, why? Why would we want to do this? And in general, we've got uh, a number of different things that I've at least highlighted. Um, I'm sure there are many more, but one is speed. Um, next, flexibility and resilience, scalability, efficiency, and once again, convenience. All of those features uh, really, in my mind, kind of sell it, but let's talk about what do we mean by that. So in the classic server virtualization environment, we have these concept of VMs or virtual machines, these operating systems instances that run on top. Uh, in a classical server environment, it might take quite a while to install an operating system and put software on it. But with a virtual machine, uh, you can do it very, very fast. Uh, you can create multiple ones. Uh, you can use a template even. And you can create the same machine many, many times um, without having to depend on a lot of the extra work that happens at the server level. Uh, even a server classically booting up takes a long time. But a virtual machine doesn't have to wait for the hardware because it's just a software instance. So the time between a virtual machine booting as compared to a physical server, we're looking at seconds on the virtual machine side, whereas in uh, classic hardware boot could take minutes. Um, recovery, also much faster. Uh, if you're trying to restore from a backup, and this is a scenario that I think everyone should be eventually comfortable with because it's not a matter of if something will go wrong, it's a matter of when, uh, and for various reasons. But having those backups um, possible in a short period of time reduces your downtime and just makes things easier. You can be the uh, the hero in, in the scenario when you're trying to get back online. Um, making backups is also much quicker um, because of that uh, non-dependence, if you will, on the underlying hardware. Virtual machine can just uh, back up with some special techniques and even that isn't even directly related to the operating system underneath. So flexibility. Machines uh, are easily moved between hardware. And the reason I think that one is really, really important to understand is that uh, when you're not tied to the physical hardware, if something is going wrong or if you need to perform maintenance, you can, but you don't have to schedule a maintenance window necessarily. You can just move your very important um, operating system instance and maybe you're running a SCADA system or a historian but the hardware that it's running on uh, needs some driver patching or something, uh, firmware updates for security reasons even. No problem. You can move the virtual machine to another host, do your patching, move them back. As far as the end users or the, uh, those running in the plant floor, they have no idea that anything ever happened. Hardware and software are decoupled and can be upgraded independently. That is huge. Uh, just kind of as I was also talking is that um, not only can you upgrade um, firmware and patching, you could upgrade the entire hardware. If you need a new server, it's reached its end of life cycle uh, or end of life, I should say. You can buy a new server, bring it into your um, virtualization, um, we'll call it a, a cluster, and have it available with its new hardware and then migrate virtual machines to it and then deco or decommission the, the, the old one, all without having to ever shut down if that's what your need is. Um, likewise, you can upgrade the software without upgrading the hardware. Um, sometimes you might want to move to uh, a newer operating system or um, maybe you need to run an older operating system even. Both of those are possible because of the, the disconnect between those uh, in terms of the dependencies. Uh, duplication of virtual machines for testing. I kind of men mentioned of that earlier, but th in this case, it's also a matter of, hey, I'm worried about something happening. What might happen if I install this patch or upgrade? Um, you know, production downtime can be a scary thing. 
in this case, if you really want to test it, uh, you can create an entire test environment that's virtualized. Uh, and or maybe even if it's just a single VM, you just want to test a specific change. You can do that uh, by creating a separate one, a separate VM of the exact machine that you want to test on. You can deploy your patching or your testing uh, against that machine so that you're out of band of the that production environment. You can do all of the checks that you need to do, and then when you're comfortable, you can either bring that VM in to production and replace the one that you're using, or you could then do the patching on the live environment, depending on how you, you kind of want to run your environment. Uh, it's not uncommon to even have entire um, industrial control systems have a virtualized um, testing or uh, development uh, setup so that they can test end to end with all sorts of connections that uh, allows them to, to test everything without affecting production. That is a very common thing. Uh, virtualization can be used to run older operating systems I mentioned uh, and, and the reason that is significant is because we know that not everybody has uh, you know the latest and greatest applications for for their use case. Oftentimes there are environments that are running older applications that were tailor made for their particular site. And those applications happen to run on Windows 95. Uh, I'm not ne necessarily saying that that is the greatest thing to do from a security standpoint or things like that, but we certainly understand that sometimes that needs to happen, uh, if not just to extend the, the longevity of it while they're working on the upgrades. That is possible with virtualization. Um, you don't have to worry about that special server failing in the middle of the night because the hardware is 15 or 20 years old. Uh, you can run it on new hardware that is, you know, new and supported and up to date while still having that legacy system running and, until you can have a, a suitable replacement. And that honestly is probably uh, one of the, gr the the greatest things that we can do with virtualization, especially when we're we're coming into facilities um, that have aging infrastructure. And you know, the big takeaway of that is that you know, in, as a general rule, maintenance doesn't always require downtime. Uh, and that is becoming more and more of a need as we see 24 hour, seven, uh, seven day a week operations. Um, you know, we expect things to be on a lot more, I think, than we used to. And virtualization is one of the ways that we can enable that. Resilience. So um, what happens when things go wrong or when, you know, somebody makes a mistake that all, you know, that that does happen. Snapshots. Uh, this is a technology uh, that, at least in terms of name, is particular to VMware, but uh, it allows you to basically um, take an instance of this VM and say any changes that happen afterwards, I want to put those on a separate place. And in the event that I don't like what they did, I'm going to just roll the whole server back to the state before. Um, it's not entirely out of the, the realm of what you might call a backup. The difference though is that the time to restore is extremely fast. Once again, a matter of you know minutes uh, or less. So if uh, you are doing something on a live server and something happens, you roll back, no harm. It's very, very easy. Uh, that also kind of plays into the next point of reduced downtime. Uh, you're not going to have uh, the same amount of issues if you had a, a patching issue when you can recover quickly and then you can troubleshoot that out of band. You can get things back to where they need to be while um, you're looking into the issue rather than spending you know, the next four hours starting at midnight to 4 a.m. when your original downtime window was. Uh, nobody wants to be that guy uh, and certainly nobody wants to um, have that kind of pressure on them. So. Uh, automated recovery and this kind of once again um, plays into the whole not if but when something might go wrong. Um, we know that no operating system is perfect uh, or no application is perfect. Sometimes things hang. Uh, automated recovery allows the underlying system to monitor itself and the applications that are running and when an issue is detected uh, it can restart the machine if that's your choice, or you can do a number of other actions. That way, um, or at the very least, you would be even just let know that something was wrong. That way you don't hear it from the, the people on the line, and that's the first time that you're knowing about the problem. 
Instead, the system can tell you about these issues. You can be more proactive. Um, or if it's something that can stand a restart automatically, the system can do that for you too. That way you're maintaining a certain level of service in your overall environment uh, without uh, having to be on call or um, actively connected in troubleshooting problems 24 hours a day, seven days a week, which is a difficult thing to do for anyone. High availability and fault tolerance, these are huge. Um, what if you have a system that just cannot stand a downtime uh, or even a short recovery uh, in terms of a restart or an application crash? What can we do there? Uh, high availability allows you to provide yourself with protection against the, you know, the failure of underlying hardware. You've got these physical servers that are running these virtual machines and you have a couple of them. Maybe you've got an application that um, needs to move over or restart uh, and do so quickly in the event uh, the physical server fails. High availability is an option. It's a simple, simple checkbox that enables those virtual machines to restart on a different host in the event of a hardware failure. That can be huge, especially in the middle of the night. Taking it even one step further, you have fault tolerance. This ability to literally run two instances simultaneously, even if the application itself doesn't support that. And I make that kind of the, the little asterisk on this because um, oftentimes applications uh, will have a redundant um, concept in them. You know, you can have a primary and secondary SCADA server, but what if there is a particular application that you need that level of uptime, but it doesn't have it built into the application? Fault tolerance can give you that capability by doing it at the lower level, at the hypervisor level or the, or the VM level. And by so doing, um, if once again you have a hardware failure, normally all the virtual machines that were running on that hardware would be stopped. High availability could restart them, but what if you just can't have them go down at all? Well, in that case, with the fault tolerance, it's still running. It's already running on the other server. It didn't have any startup time. It literally switched from one to the other um, with you know, sub millisecond recovery. So it, just as fast as any application high availability that you can think of, whether you're talking about an HMI server, a data server, or anything else. Dynamic load balancing. So this is a case where Obviously, these servers don't have the infinite capability to do everything. Um, so you have a pool of re hardware resources. You don't have to necessarily even make the decisions about where certain VMs live, where they're run. You can have the system do that for you. You can put in even rules that say, I don't want the same uh, servers to be on the same or two different servers to be on the same hardware. Uh, you have a primary and secondary domain controller or a primary and secondary SCADA server. You can tell them to automatically keep them separated. Once again, you, it's, it's about taking out some of those, those general concerns and making use of this common pool of resources to do some extra lifting for you. Finally, there's a proactive failure remediation, and this is where it's literally looking for, hey, maybe there's something going wrong. Do you want to do something about it before you actually notice a problem? Uh, I can detect various health levels in the underlying hardware or in the VM and say, I think we should probably move stuff off of this host. Also possible. Um, a, a number of special features to make sure that your systems are running when you expect them to be. And of course, in, in many of these instances, these, these capabilities just aren't available if it's not virtualized. You certainly can have application redundancy, um, but Without this, a lot of these hardware redundancies just aren't possible. Whereas in, if you have application redundancy coupled with the hardware redundancy, uh, you're, you're looking at an availability window that is, you know, on sometimes on the order of five nines or more. And so that's just something you just can't necessarily achieve with direct hardware. Okay, scalability, you know, how, how much does this scale? I'm like, well, the internet, and in the cloud is an example of scalability of virtualization. As I said earlier, it's all based on that. Um, the, easy, uh, the ease of accommodating new VMs and new, hard, uh, new functions within that same hardware. Uh, you can spin up new virtual machines as long as you have the physical resources until you run out. 
obviously we want to keep a little margin for for things moving up and down but it, it makes it very very easy it's not a matter of procuring hardware you can add additional uh virtual servers uh as needed and i think that's one of the other things is that you know previously the we had to plan these things out a long time uh, you might have to allocate space physically for new servers and things like that um, with proper uh, server licensing or operating system licensing and with the the right resources available within your um, hardware pool of resources in this virtualization environment you can move quickly to address needs whether it be a security need or uh, a functional need like uh, the addition of uh, additional data moving um, between things and maybe uh, you're interested in cybersecurity and you want to add some network scanning capabilities or things like that or you need to share some information with an MES system or with a you know various uh, other places uh, you want to do updates and you want an update server those things are very very easy to deploy uh, you can properly provision the physical servers uh, to host many VMs simultaneously. And I think that's key to the scalability is that it allows you to think about it ahead of time, meaning that uh, you can over provision the server with additional resources, uh, compute capa uh, capability, storage and um, hardware, and then you can continually consume it as time goes by um, without worry that uh, it will go underutilized or uh, wasted because the flexibility option is always there. And as we'll talk about in the next slide in terms of efficiency, uh, you're, you're, you're saving money. And I, I, I want to explain that a little bit in, in just a second. Um, when it comes to the usage the usage of your hardware this is where i think virtualization really um shines and maybe this isn't quite uh as well understood in the in the classic sense of traditional servers but most of the time your server isn't working very hard uh, most of the time you know the cpu isn't running at a hundred percent you're probably not using most of your memory and of, of course you hopefully you're not using all of your storage the servers really complain when that happens but when you go virtual, now you have the ability to really leverage your hardware investment in a much, much better way. You have significant energy savings. And the reason is, is you're just not running as many physical servers, so you're not using as much energy. Uh, you can do more with less hardware. Uh, consolidation ratios uh, are kind of wide, widely across the board, or I should say very widely across the board. Um, between six and 10 to one, it's not unheard of to go even beyond that depending on the situation. But those are very, very um, conservative estimates in terms of consolidation. And as hardware gets more and more powerful, you can see even greater consolidation ratios. And of course, if I said that you could use six times less energy than you are now or 10 times less energy as you are now, um, I think we can all agree that that would generally be better. Um, and not for just the, the direct cost of the energy. There's also other things. Um, you know, jumping over the hardware cost for a second, the heating and cooling requirements. I mean, it takes energy to cool down those servers, keep them comfortable. It takes energy uh, to 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 make your environment uh, happy in terms of getting the the best life out of your hardware, and the less energy you have to put into the system, like the cooling system, um, you can un you can size that down. You know, all of those things are capital expenses you don't have to spend. And that kind of goes back to the overall lower hardware cost. It's not just the lower cost in servers, it's the lower cost in the entire environment. Um, instead of having to put in uh, a cooling system and the electrical um, infrastructure to support a giant environment, uh, you can support a much, much smaller one with fewer servers. Uh, and that even includes uh, your backups, meaning your power system. For instance, if you have a UPS, something that prevents you from having things shut down when you have a, a power outage or a blip. You don't have to make that ginormous either, which adds additional savings when it comes to capital expenses sizing your environment because you're just not using as much power. 
So, I mean, overall, uh, you've reduced the hardware footprint. You reduced the physical footprint. There's not as much space required, and you reduce the cooling, the power. You really cut out all of the major expenses in terms of what it takes to deploy hardware um, in a data center style environment. And because of that, you've got less servers to support. You've got less uh, of everything except for time. You're going to have a lot more time because you don't have to deal with these things. Lastly, let's talk convenience. Um, you know, in an, in an administrative way, uh, dealing with lots and lots of servers, uh, it seems simple. And in some ways, there's definitely going to be an argument that, uh, you know, 24 different physical servers all running the same operating system seems simpler. Um, but with the virtualization layer added, you do get some very, very um, easy and central built in administrative layer capabilities that uh, hopefully overcome that particular concept of, of the simplicity of the previous model while giving you the flexibility that a little bit of extra complexity adds. Uh, you have a single pane of glass that you can look through things. You can see the health of all of your virtual machines as well as your physical servers in one place. You can manage backups in a single place. You can configure and change physical, I should say physical, virtual hardware uh, in a single place. Maybe you've got a VM that is uh, complaining. You, you recently added more clients or something and it needs more memory. That can be done with a few mouse clicks. If you think of it in, uh, if I should say, if the VM is deployed in a way that you were planning on needing to scale it eventually, you can even have it ready to accept more virtual hardware without even shutting it down. Um, that's what we call a hot ad. Uh, and talk about flexibility, you know, it's kind of like single click problem remediation. I mean, you can't beat that. Uh, once again, and I mentioned this a little bit before, backup, backups are much faster. Um, and you have more options in how you do backups. And that's probably even the bigger takeaway because they're virtualized. You can do backups of virtual machines. You could copy the virtual machine as a file in the worst case scenario and say, here, I'm going to put this somewhere else and I'm going to keep it in cold storage or I'm going to give it to somebody else to look at somewhere else. Um, that's a lot easier than physically moving a server or giving it to a systems integrator or, or a troubleshooting entity to look at. Uh, you've got options for orchestrated disaster recovery. Uh, that I think is huge. Um, and, and mind you, a lot of these things aren't just for um, the industrial side. Most of these things are actually reasons why classic IT environments have been using this for a long, long time. But I just want to make mention that uh, some of these things you're seeing more and more requirements coming into the industrial space. And uh, a lot of uh, OT or um, administrators are asking, how am I going to do these things? How am I going to meet these requirements? And virtualization really is the answer in many instances to do this in a way that it's easy and it's scalable. Uh, IT people will be very familiar with it. There's lots of help um, in that regard, um, hopefully from your IT team or certainly from an integrator such as Matrix or even tons of just information on the internet about how these things can be done. Analysis tools uh, reside within the environment as well. It's not just a single plane of glass for management, but also for troubleshooting. Uh, you can see when a, a virtual machine has um, a high CPU utilization. You don't even have to be inside the server. You don't have to be logged into that server to see it. You can see it from the outside, and that makes troubleshooting from the network side, the compute side, the memory utilization, and many other factors very, very easy. Um, so. Uh, overall, they've really tried hard to make the, uh, if I would say, the simplicity of the classic environment um, not as, uh, I'm going to say, uh, appealing as the convenience of the administration. It takes out the concerns when it comes to the added, flex, uh, added complexity by adding flexibility. Well, there's a tongue twister there. So things to know, just kind of wrapping up here real quick, is that virtualization works best when communication is Ethernet. 
Um, that is its primary means. If you have other um, physical ways of communicating, uh, we need to think about that. There are ways to address it. Um, USB to Ethernet uh, is a very common way of addressing that. You can um, be very, very flexible and have all of your uh, VM still movable without directly connecting hardware to uh, the physical hosts or the virtual machines by allowing things to actually ride over Ethernet. Um, and the benefits are realized when you have uh, more than a few VMs. This is where we're talking about consolidation. You really get a lot of the benefits when you can put more than just a couple of servers. You still get a lot of them without that, but when it comes to the cost savings, you're going to get a lot more savings the more you consolidate. Now it does obviously add an administration layer on top, so you have to be aware of that, that there is a little bit of extra um, complexity to understand in terms of how things are happening. But uh, for the, the more part, I think that, that uh, it is actually doing more work for you than it, it is creating work for you. Hypervisor, uh, which once again, we talked about that, that's that administration layer. It does require additional licensing costs in many instances, so that is something to think about. There's uh, no free lunch in terms of that added flexibility will have a cost. But generally, you can offset that by the um, reduction in the cost of your physical hardware. Um, now, also to get the most out of it, you're going to want central storage. Uh, that is often something that you may already have in a traditional server environment, but it's almost what I would call essential in uh, some way when it comes to virtualization. And that central storage can be a NAS, there's a network, network attached storage, or a SAN, a storage array network very similar in a lot of ways, or vSAN as we mentioned earlier, which is you know this logical storage, uh, virtualized storage that's spread across physical hosts. Um, but those are the ways that you really want to store the VM. So think about that in terms of infrastructure. And lastly, virtualization isolates the operating system instances on the same physical host. And that's great and does a pretty good job of that, but that doesn't mean that we don't want to still use best security practices like firewalls, and keeping operating systems up to date and all those things. All those things are still very, very important. So is virtualization a good fit? My answer, of course, I am presenting today would be yes, uh, in almost all cases that it is. Um, systems with only a few functional uh, server roles that won't change hardly ever. And I mean, I don't want to be presumptuous, but I my crystal ball fell off my desk, so I don't know where it went. But what I mean by that is that it's very difficult to predict the future. You don't know um, what will be asked of the system in the future. And so I would say that even in those instances, it's something to consider. Uh, because uh, tomorrow uh, you might have a hardware failure and you aren't able to uh, procure a replacement. What, what do you do? Well, in a virtualized environment, that's not really an issue. So even from a scalability standpoint, um, if it's not making the most sense from the number of VMs, you can deploy what I call smaller installations, very, very uh, concise ones. Most companies um, will eventually increase the number of VMs because the requirements increase. Um, so scalability is probably the biggest reason I would say to go for it along with the consolidation. But even in small environments, uh, there are solutions um, for supporting uh, little environments. And those are tailor-made solutions that oftentimes also cost less and are, are simpler to deploy. So I should make mention of that. Um, there is one other thing to consider, and that would be who is going to support it. Um, if you're not comfortable with doing the day-to-day -day maintenance of, but you still want that flexibility, there are great resources available. Um, certainly, Matrix could help. Uh, we would be happy to uh, in terms of moving a system to virtualized uh, environment as well. But uh, getting uh, support from a Dell or uh, Microsoft or um, a VMware uh, in terms of those big players is also a great way to start. They can walk you through it. Uh, there's training available. So I, I just want you to be aware that this is something that is supportable very, very much so, and there's a number of resources that are available to help. And with that, I will open it up for question and answers. All right, thank you, Dan, very good. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in, and the first one is around 
um, our preferences. So this question around what is our preferred software platform for this and what's our preferred hardware? So. Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I, I would say that I, I, I'm i going to make a little bit more broad. Um, I have a personal preference, but I, I want to kind of rule out my bias. Um, uh, I would say going with a generally um, well-respected hardware vendor is important. If your environment um, or your IT department or your company has a contract with one side or another, a Dell or an HP or something like that, generally I'd say that that is probably your best bet, especially since they probably have better pricing um, if you're going to be purchasing the hardware. Um, I myself like Dell. Um, and VMware and Dell currently have a very close relationship, so I also side on the VMware side in terms of the hypervisor. Uh, however, uh, Microsoft has quickly gained a lot of traction in that space as well, and their solution certainly is not uh, something you want to overlook. Um, they actually have some pricing advantages because of the way that they license their operating systems. Um, so you can still gain a lot of uh, benefit from that, but if, if I had to answer, I would say that you know a, a Dell VMware solution is my primary, um, but I've done many others. I've done HP with VMware. I've done Microsoft on name your hardware. Uh, so it's not like either one of them is is uh, necessarily uh, better in all instances. I think that would be uh, kind of presumptuous to say. So it, it really depends on um, your environment and if you if you have the choice to choose between one another i would say vmware and dell okay uh, the next question is around transition so it, uh, how easy is it to transition from a physical to a virtual infrastructure uh good question um the the way that goes about um at least in part will happen or uh, i should say uh, depend on um, you know what your requirements are for that transition. As a general rule, it's not particularly difficult um, if you bring somebody in like Matrix to do that. Um, we're going to ask some pointed questions about your environment, whether you um, can stand some downtime and things like that, whether you're planning on spinning up new um, servers in the process or whether you literally want to transition what you have to virtual. Those are all questions that need to come into play. But overall, I would say that it's not that difficult. Um, you're, you're physically procuring hardware. You're procuring a hypervisor, which is not that much different than procuring an operating system. It's just a very special one. And then you're either migrating the existing machines that you have into virtual machines, which you can use a technology called P to V, physical to virtual. And then they be instead of being a physical server with a physical operating system, or should say physical server with an operating system and applications, those applications and operating system now get migrated into a virtual machine. Or you can build out the entire infrastructure and create new VMs and new functionally equivalent platform side by side, and then cut over to that um, after you're after you're ready to. Uh, in either case. Um, you know, it's relatively easy, uh, especially for those of us that have done it many times. OK, um, next question. <clears throat> I'm not sure Dan, if you'll be able to answer this because I'm not sure that I have enough information, but I'll ask it as it was put into the chat box here. If you have used USB for hardware licenses on Rockwell systems, can you elaborate? Um, I will. I'll say that carefully because I personally haven't um, utilized it for Rockwell, but I do know um, of a solution that generally gets us around that issue. Um, there, I made just a very brief mention of it, um, and like anything, we'd want to test this before we did uh, anything to make sure that it was, uh, you know, very, very um, stable solution. But as I mentioned earlier, there's these USB to Ethernet devices. Because virtual machines classically talk strictly Ethernet, um, especially if you want the flexibility to move them, which is one of their main advantages. And so what we'll do is we'll put hardware keys such as that on a USB to Ethernet um, device. And this device will then have an IP address just like any other device on the network. 
And then what it, it comes with special software that you can then deploy to the virtual machine that allows you to map a specific USB port on the device to the specific VM um, using the software uh, add-in on the VM. And that way, even if the, the virtual machine moves between hardware, it still has that connection to that single device. Um, we've used that successfully in a number of instances with uh, clients other than Rockwell. Um, we may even have used it with Rockwell. I just haven't personally done it. I've done it with uh, Wonderware. So nonetheless, uh, generally, I would say that we do have a solution for that. We just want to look into the specific instance to make sure that it, it's something that will work for you. Okay. Well, see, you had the answer, Dan. I <laughs> All right. Um, the next question is, what's the difference between fault tolerant versus high availability? Are there design considerations for one over the other? Sure. Uh, so the difference, and mind you, I should make mention is that those two terms are very specifically VMware. Um, Hyper-V and Microsoft have um, different terms for a lot of that functionality. But in, in terms of the, the VMware side, uh, um, high availability is basically when you're trying to address the concern uh, of a VM being down because of the failure of its underlying host, meaning the, the physical hardware. If that host you know, goes offline for whatever reason, maybe even a power outage or, or a failed power supply, all the VMs that were running on that um, classically will stop. They'll just not be running. However, uh, if you need that VM to restart, there will be a short outage. And I make mention that obviously VMs do restart quickly, is that it, it'll notice that that server has failed and with high availability turned on for that VM, that VM will automatically start up on a different host in the cluster, one that has capacity to run it. The one requirement of that, as was kind of asked in the question, is that that VM needs to be um, housed or, or um, the storage side of it has to be on what's called shared storage, like a SAN or a NAS, something that both or all, I should say, of the um, hosts are able to see. That way, when the host says, hey, I can't hear the other host, he's dead, um, something happened to him, I'm going to start up that VM or any of the VMs that were checked for fault tolerant or excuse me, uh, high availability on me or one of the other available servers. And it can do that because the VM is just a file. It's a, a, a set of files that are on the shared storage. So all of the hosts have access to them. Regarding the um, fault tolerance, uh, that does have a little bit extra requirement on top of the ones that I just mentioned for high availability. Uh, you also want a very high speed network interconnection between those because you're passing a lot of information back and forth in order to keep those two VMs synchronized. Um, there are also limitations in how many VMs can actually be run that way because of the amount of um, both processing power and um, network traffic that have to uh, be consumed in order to support that. So it's not something that you use in all instances. I would say in, in, in best practice, you're probably going to want to use application level um, redundancy first if your application supports it, and then high availability, perhaps even on top of that, and then at the worst case or the, your most critical systems, which hopefully aren't a ton, you can go to fault tolerance, but you can only run a certain number of VMs under fault tolerance. And, and fault tolerance, by the way, also is in place of uh, uh, high ability, excuse me, high availability. Uh, you wouldn't really need to have both because you're already running two instances. So, okay. All right, I think we have time for this one last question before we need to wrap up. Um, and that is, can I have IT and OT on the same infrastructure? Good question. Um, and I, I'm going to answer that once again carefully. Is the short answer is that yes, you know, anything is possible. Um, as to whether that is necessarily a good idea may depend a lot on your environment. Um, one of the things that we like to generally see is a, a separation of responsibilities. Um, not because of uh, trust issues or things like that, but because uh, uh, coordination is oftentimes a challenge. And 
the OT side has specific requirements uh, for their system that may not necessarily match the same requirements that IT has. Um, neither of them is wrong, it's just that they're different. If they are on shared infrastructure, you're going to need to spend that much more time um, both with the administrative division as well as making sure that your security concerns for the protection of your environment are there. Um, all of that just becomes that much more important. Whereas in if you have uh, separated infrastructure, uh, some of those still exist, but some of them are not nearly as significant because you already have a, a controlled administrative boundary that you can place between them. Um, traditionally using like a, an industrial demilitarized zone for the network side of it. And since the physical hardware is separate, that administrative boundary already exists. So short answer is yes. Um, the long answer is uh, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe it's not. And uh, you'd want to talk through that with your IT department um, and your OT department to get a, an idea as to whether that's a good idea for your environment. All right. Well, Dan, thank you very much. We're just a little one minute over our time limit. Want to make sure we honor that time commitment. Certainly appreciate everybody joining us today and thank Dan for the presentation. And, and if you need to have further information from Matrix, you do have Dan's contact info and, and Matrix in general. So look forward to talking to you further and how we can help you in your applications. Thank you very much.